Welcome back to The Daily Mastermind. My name is George Wright III with your daily dose of inspiration, motivation, and education. And I've got a, a special Daily Mastermind edition for the weekend for you. It's a interview and a mastermind that I did with one of my private mastermind groups. And I did it with uh, uh, best-selling author Aaron Adams. He's one of my nine-figure, eight-figure, nine-figure mentors that I work with a real estate expert. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on him, and then we will just cut right to our uh, our mastermind session with him. So Aaron has been a full-time real estate investor since leaving his job teaching high school in the early 2000s. He's purchased thousands of properties in California, Indiana, Missouri, Texas, Florida, pretty much all over the place. And he's um, purchased several thousand properties, primarily with the focus of it being single-family homes in blue-collar and middle-class neighborhoods. But it's not limited to that. He has experience and done transactions in apartment complexes, commercial property, new construction, mobile home parks, Airbnb, you name it. Um, Now, he's currently focused in Indianapolis, Charlotte, Kansas City, and Dallas. But he runs a massive turnkey, turnkey operation of the acquisition, the rehab, the construction, the management. Uh, he's got a master's degree from uh, Cal, Cal Poly in business. He speaks Spanish fluently, and his business um, actually provides turnkey passive real estate for individuals um, all over the country and internationally. But he buys hundreds of single-family homes on a on a on an average monthly basis, and he fixes them up, rents them, manages them, sells them. And unlike the competitors that he has, he does all of it in house. He does he owns all of his businesses. So Aaron is an amazing speaker. He's an author. He's, um, you know, his new book, um, Tips, Tricks, Foreclosures, and Flips of a Real Estate Millionaire, was um, put out by Wiley, and it's out on uh, out in the marketplace right now, so I encourage you to get it. But he is by far one of the most successful, um, you know, eight, nine-figure mentors that I know. And so I definitely want to give you access to this special mastermind I did. I'm super excited to share it with you. So Take a notebook. It's an extra long one. Take some notes. Listen to it over and over, and I hope you'll find some value in it. Have an amazing day, Aaron. Thanks for taking time, man. You're a busy, dude. We're we're super glad to have you here on the on the mastermind. Thanks, man. I uh, tonight's late night hockey for my for my son from nine to ten p.m. So so I still my day is not over yet. <laughs> Oh, dude, it's it, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a uh, powerful session here, but I, I mean, it's hard to squeeze in. So we really, I think, rarely get the opportunity to kind of have the behind the scenes and everything else. So what I'm hoping to do with the group today is I want to start by giving just a little bit of background from you on you know kind of where you came from and what what you feel like the keys were to kind of get you into into success of where you're at, and then we can drill into some mindset and you know, active passive income in real estate. But could you maybe start us out with a little bit of a background as to, you know, wh- where this, this where you came from, from teaching and what do you think was the key to shift you into entrepreneur mode? You know, um, I've always been a, a student, um, whether it's of school or, you know, we were talking before we started, I've been rereading some some books on leadership that I read 10 years ago. And you know, uh, when you're when you're doing five million dollars a year in total revenue, it's different from when you're doing 20 times that. And um, it's interesting because at different points in your journey, you you think you want something from your business or your personal life or your money, so you go after it. And then when you get it or you get partially to that destination, you realize that uh, it wasn't as big of a deal as you thought it would be. And so, you know, while teaching high school, I thought, you know, I want uh, I want more money, which a lot of people do. And so I, I started reading books and attending seminars and and and, and going to, and with networking groups and started doing deals uh, 20 years ago. And um, absolutely, I started making money. I mean, uh, the, the fourth year uh, at the high school, I made uh, $400,000 and was still making 40 grand teaching. And, um, wow. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, it's funny, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine today, he's a judge, and we were just, uh, you know, we were talking about how much embezzlement he sees. And, you know, uh, you, you haven't arrived as an entrepreneur until you've caught one of your employees stealing from you. Uh, it's, you know, it's like a rite of passage. And, um, you know, the amount of anxiety that it gives you once you have something to lose it, whether whether it's an asset you're trying to protect and or whether it's you know having systems that protect your own employees from from taking from you, 
it creates a whole different level of anxiety because there's the anxiety from poverty. And there's the anxiety from from losing what you have to uh, you know to lawsuits or, or or by theft. And so what's really interesting is 20 years down the road, you realize that anxiety never goes away. Uh, the one constant is you know it, it's just it's just what what gives you stress. So I'm you know I'm not worried about the the Wi-Fi bill or I'm not worried that uh, you know, I have utilities for, for four different homes that I keep, but, uh, I have a whole different type of anxiety. And, and so the same skill set that's required to make a million bucks, to make $10 million, to make a hundred million dollars is the same skill set that you need to protect, uh, those things. And to, you know, you start thinking about legacy and longevity. And so, uh, I, I like, I, I love a group like this because it creates uh, a platform for, um, for for discussing these kinds of things because there's tons of platforms for you know how do you buy a mobile home how do you flip but but um a group like this gives you the chance to kind of go take a deeper dive into these kinds of things well also i've i've learned from being around you enough that it's not and this is this is eight and nine figure thinkers right it's not the strategy it's not the thing you guys think differently like your thinking is what kind of got you where you are and what you're doing. It wasn't the other way around. You didn't start thinking creatively after you were making a lot of money, right? Right. Yeah. yeah right. And it's you know like this morning I was getting ready and um, I'm in between travel. I really don't have much going on this week. I had maybe two hours worth of work and I found myself rushing to get to the gym and then I spent a, you know full two hours working out because I had the time. But then I was, I felt I was, a, I was getting ready and I was rushing to get ready. And I'm like, what am I rushing for? Hmm. And when you build that sense of urgency into everything that you do, then, then you, you know, I, 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 and then like three hours later, I'm sitting in front of my computer waiting for emails to come in thinking, all right, what other projects can I work on? And when you've reprogrammed your brain to, to attack hard things and, and then you don't have them, you're, you're kind of like, like, Guess I should go home now. And time to leave the office. You know, it's a different, yeah. it's a different mindset. Yeah. Well, and don't you don't you feel like um, you have you know it's not about getting to a destination. You're driven by those same goals and things to get you where where when you were a teacher and you were trying to push yourself to the next level. Now you're at a, an area you're pushing yourself to the next level. It's really not that destination, right? I mean, it's always your mindset pushing you. No, it, that's that's the like the French call. That's the joie de vivre. That's the joy of life. I mean, you know, when uh, when I was at high school, I remember getting to the school at six a.m. so I could work out with uh, some of the other coaches and running around the track and uh, doing the same thing now because I have a long travel day. That that doesn't change. You know, excellence is a habit that you you know how you do anything is how you do everything, and it doesn't it's it doesn't you, you can't just be like I'm I'm exceptionally good at making money. But my diet sucks, and I'm I'm a fat piece of crap. You tend to find that people it it it, it bleeds into all aspects of their life: their money, their family, their you know their 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 their, their personal health. And you know, it's like you and I are always talking about the battle to stay healthy in your 40s. You know, that's yeah. a, that's a daily grind, man. Yeah. So what you're saying is, guys like you actually are like guys like us that still have to work out and still have to like put your <laughs> pants on one leg at a time. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so so let me ask you this. What what do you think are a couple of the keys you specifically because a lot of people have different talents. But what do you think are a couple of your unique abilities or keys to the success that's kind of taken you along the path? And then we can use that to lead into kind of some seven figure mindset stuff. But you specifically, what do you think's really helped you get to where you're at? So um, learning to be dumb enough to just do things, you know, um, to, to, I remember be, being so scared to buy an apartment complex because I'd never owned one. And the only way to learn how to own an apartment complex is to buy one. And uh, having W-2 employees is intimidating. You just need to hire one. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm working on a, um, a storage unit development right now. And I don't want to run the numbers. I just want to find one and do it and get it going because that's the only way I've ever learned anything. And so when when I bring, you know, I was in Indianapolis brainstorming with some of my employees last week and they had some ideas and I'm like, yes, yes, let's just do that. Let's just do it because as we fail forward, we'll figure it out. And that's a hard thing to do when you're coming from an analytical educational background or when you're coming from a corporate environment where nothing happens without three meetings and, and voting on resolutions. But uh, at a very personal level, you know, it was like, I had never ridden a bike and then I hurt my foot running a marathon last year. And so now 
I, I bought the biker shorts and I got the sores and now I like riding a bike because, I, you know, it's just instead of working into it, you just do it. You know, I think that's critical. And we, too, too many of us spend so much time thinking about how we're going to do something instead of just jumping in and trying it. Do you think that's a bit of your personality? Because I also see that there's a lot of that in successful people. They they don't overanalyze things. They don't fear so much. They just they just act right. They just act. But your personality is a little easier sometimes to go with, or or is it that you you've just made that decision? I'm I'm gonna say yes, and and then I'm gonna figure it out. You know, once you start doing it, it just it just it, it bleeds into everything. And um, I think uh, um, yes, it's important to to get some education at a seminar or from a book or from hearing something. But then it's just as important to plug that in and do that. And it's you know I I, I approach you. A couple of months ago, and I said, "Hey, George, you know, you have a network that I don't have of of people that I don't know, and I want to try something." And you're like, "Okay, here's a guy." And I called the guy, and and now I'm now we're moving forward. And we were just talking about it the other day, and you know, a lot of people have been talking about uh, doing that and 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 building that part of their business. And I'm just like, I'm just gonna try it. I'm just gonna figure it out, and then I'll let you know how it went. And now I'm gonna try it again. And uh, I don't know if I'm gonna make money or if I'm gonna lose money, but I know after trying it three or four times, I'm going to know a lot better. You know what's fun is it's I've noticed this about you in particular, and I'm talking about out of a lot of successful people that I know that you your you you it's a habit for you Ma saying yes and moving forward, not just a habit, but I've seen you with your people in your office and in your organization. You teach that same thing where I could see you in a brainstorming brainstorming session say whoa whoa like let's stop talking about it and try it let's just do it. Yeah. But you also um, there's a confidence in a, and, and, and do you think that for a lot of people that have this fear, I mean, it is a process, right? It's going to take the more they, they do and make it a habit that the less fear they're going to have, the less they think about it. Or is it, you just got to make the decision and, and bite the bullet. Well, I, I, number one, I have the confidence that, that I'm going to fail at some part of it. And so mm. I don't, I'm not afraid of that anymore because I also have the confidence that I'll just keep tweaking things until I figure it out because I've been doing that you know, for 20 years. And so it's having the confidence that you won't give up, uh, that, that inner confidence in yourself that you know that you'll just keep keep grinding and keep keep tweaking. I love what you just said. You said you have the confidence that you know you're going to fail. So that's out of the way. Now it's like, just be confident you're not going to stop. You're just going to keep tweaking it. And I noticed it with some of the things that you do with your organization, even in a marketing. It's one thing to say, I have the confidence, I know I'm going to fail and things like that. But you truly believe that it's through that failure that you're going to get the answers you need to move forward, right? You know, for, for a perfect example, so last week I'm in Indianapolis. We manage in 1,600 properties. We have $100,000 to $200,000 a month in maintenance calls that come in on these properties we're managing. And for years, I had this belief that you don't hire a W-2 maintenance guy because he'll be lazy. You pay him by the job. You pay him piecework. Well, that worked up to about a thousand properties, but now we're paying so much. I'm making some piecework contractor rich. Like, you know, you know I realized I paid one of my guys like, you know, a million bucks last year. And I was like, well, wait, I need W-2 guys. And so six months ago, I said to my team, guys, we got to get some W-2 guys in here. We're losing money on this piecework by the job 10 9 structure. And they're like, oh yeah, we've tried this. And and literally we sat there and I'm like, no, I want you to try this and I want you to do this and I want you to think of this and I want you to go ask this guy this. And um, I said, from a rainmaker standpoint, from a big picture standpoint, we have to do this because we just lost $50,000 this month of overpay because we don't, we're not on that structure. So I don't care where we pull them from, let's get some W2 guys in here. In four weeks, we have to have one. And, and so um, that's, that's, the, that's the difference. Whereas, you know, 20 years in, um, I get mad if, if we aren't gambling and moving forward, where my team in that case was like, well, we're going to go to some temp companies and some staffing services. And we've interviewed some people. I'm like, stop. I just, just don't tell me what you've done. Just tell me why we don't have someone here working that we're figuring this out. Yeah. So people on this call are obviously at the, you know, the, the top end of the percentage of the people that are willing to do the work. Do you feel like um, that is a transferable skill and habit to be able to say yes and move forward. And have you seen that progressively get better in your organization um, the more you hammer it? Because obviously as the leader of an organization, you know, this is Maxwell 101, you have to lead by example. You have to always be there to help them grow to the next level. But do you see that as a transferable skill to get 
individuals or do people kind of, they say, you know, you got it or you don't got it when it comes to being an entrepreneur and investor, things like that, or is that a transferable skill? So, you know, where I've seen it, it, wa it wasn't transferable until we started focusing on, on what the corporate America calls KPIs or key progress indicators, mm -hmm. key performance indicators. Yes. Every, every employee, every partner, every, every person in your organization needs a metric or a series of metrics that can be used to define their success, that they can hang their hat on or can be used to hold them accountable. And so uh, they, everybody hates them when you try to implement them. You know, for example, uh, in Indianapolis, uh, I have Heather who screens tenants for us. And I say, you know, Heather, you fail uh, if we get over seven evictions in a month and you don't get your bonus. And she hated that at first until she had four evictions in a month. And then she was like, you know, spiking the football, uh, throwing it down or, you know, saying to one of my partners, I remember having a conversation with one of my partners a couple of years ago and I said, your attrition rate. I said, hey, do you have one contractor right now that's done three jobs with you? I said, you're, you're burning through contractors because you're actually too mm -hmm. harsh with them. You're grinding them too hard. You're probably not paying them enough. And, and your attrition rate is atrocious. And, you know, they, they didn't like that either until they came back six months later and said, I just have a contractor that finished six jobs. And so, um, um, I found that as I really think thoughtfully kind of implement uh, metrics mm. and KPIs with my team that when we interact about those KPIs, uh, they can feel the, the we need to be figuring this out uh, kind of, uh, or grades, like having the courage to say to your, to, to, to say to your employee, I was sitting down, in December, I was sitting down and I said to people, hey, you know, what I'm getting from you right now is a B minus. And let me tell you why, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, they hated that. They hated that. But then when, when uh, two months later, I'm like, you know, I honestly feel like you're doing B plus work now. And let me tell you why. Then they, they, they couldn't have been more thrilled. And so as a leader, having the courage to, uh, to put numbers out there and not just goals, but just, you know, ways to say, like, this was, you, you failed because you were within this parameter of failure. And this is why it's my fault because I need, as the as the leader, I need to give you a better system that helps you become more successful. You know, every failure is my fault because I lose the most money. So I never put that that rock in the backpack of my team. But at the same, then it's always a we solution. And you know, what's funny is all my best ideas come from them. Or you know, I, I wish I could say that I originated great ideas. I'm just good at recognizing them. Well, you're good at pulling them out of people as well, which is good. I, I, I love how you said, and, and that really clicked for me because transitioning that skill is not something that's easy to do until you start measuring it with, you know, you got to have a scoreboard, you got to have the KPIs or grades, because then all of a sudden, all the focus is on that skill set that you want to develop. I noticed that when I came to your operation, because Aaron runs a, a massive operation in, in Indy, and I, and I was thinking to myself, man, I've run, you know, big companies, but having thousands of properties to manage and uh, rehab and having hundreds of contractors. How do you do this? And you're like, it's simple. I have one report for this person. I have one report for that person. And all I got to do is look at it and I know if they're doing it. But it was always like, I thought it was really strange that you're like the the amount of delinquent rent, that is it. And, and we know that's the metric I'm going to measure this person with or the amount of jobs in the queue. You know, and so that's huge. I really like that. But I also think you do a really good job of do you feel like by having those metrics, it allows you to be more in some ways hands off, like it gives them a little autonomy to look, just get the job done? Or is it because yeah, you're, just, I'll never, you're not a micromanager at all? We'll never run it. I'll, 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 I'll never create an SOP, right? A, a standard operating procedure okay. that, that a lot of franchises mm. have, because I feel like the minute you start to spell that out, then people hide behind that. I mean, I worked uh, at a union job in a casino and it was just a, a, a restaurant job, but it was amazing how people hid behind. I, the one that I'll never forget was, you know, in the casino you had housekeeping and then you had restaurant bartenders and food servers. And if a glass broke, we couldn't pick that up because that's housekeeping. That wasn't part of our negotiated contract, right? And yeah. I, hate, I hate that. Like I hate when that creeps in the whole, that's not my job mentality because uh, you, you know, it's like, sink or swim as a, as a group, but you know, there's a, there's a fine line as a leader between kicking the dog and highlighting failure or contribution to failure. I mean, you and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big BYU basketball fan and uh, I noticed this last week, they jumped into the top 25 on a lot of polls and 
you know, Joe Lenardi says you're going to be a seven seed. It's like, my, you might write that in stone, right? And then I was reading an article today that was talking about the commitment to analytics as a program and this new coach that came in last mm. year, Mark Pope, how he just, he brought in the guy from the Lakers that did the analytics. And then they were talking about specific players on the court, how, um, you know, one player was like, yeah, I, I didn't realize that I shoot threes so much better from this spot on the court. So I'd try to take more threes from that spot. And, and, and business is the same that way as sports. There's a sc overall scoreboard that defines success, but then every person should have analytics and data and metrics then that they um, use to, to, to define success on a daily level. And if they don't have those, and if you haven't empowered them with that and the system to implement that and the tools to implement that, then uh, scalability becomes impossible because then the business needs you to be there. In my case, I was forced out of my markets because I had the opportunity to be the full custody dad of my boys in Idaho, something that I've happily done. And so we kind of fell into the, the you know, we, we, we kept falling and kept stumbling. And until I really embraced this to where I could sit in Idaho and evaluate how construction is doing in Charlotte um, by the numbers, I couldn't really, you know, be confident that things were go going well in Charlotte without flying there every month. Yeah. No, that's 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 interesting because you also I, I've noticed um, you're willing to fail. You know, you're going to fail. But you're also willing to let your people fail. I mean, there's been some, and maybe you even have some examples of some catastrophic failures. And where most people would be like, "Oh man, that like that person is fired. Like that is, I'm gonna pull a Donald Trump on this guy. Like he is gone." You know, um, you're like, "Man, best investment I ever made. I'm not letting them go anywhere or what." So tell me a little bit about that because you're uh, you allow others to fail as well. Yeah. So there's autonomy to grow, little measurements, you know, scoreboard keeping but there's some real latitude there on mistakes. Yeah, so, um, you know, because one of the things I've been testing the last couple of years is, of course, if if I can convince George Wright to come run my Charlotte operation, it's gonna be good. Like, that's 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 not a big deal. Now I'm giving up, you know, 50% of my profits. So for me, the holy grail has been, how do I convince um, somebody who's 20% of George Wright to come to Charlotte with no real estate background and then build them just they have the desire they have the willingness uh, right so so you know like what mcdonald's does mcdonald's assumes that you don't even know how to cook a burger and so their systems walk you through meticulously whether you're in china or washington dc so the same burger comes out of the assembly line so uh you know i have i have uh somebody here in idaho uh who was working for me in indiana and he had he spoke spanish which uh, that was huge so i said you know mike i'm going to teach you how to run construction and uh, and you will lose my money, and but I'm happy to pay that tuition for you to learn to manage contractors in mm -hmm. Idaho. And so you know we uh, we we just finished an apartment that was he let the the Hispanics choose the color, so the walls are pale purple lavender, right? <laughs> That's a very popular interior Hispanic color, and and the property owner hated it. And we had one of our contractors return a hot water heater. Return, you know, you know, we gave him the money for the hot water heater. He bought it and then returned it two days later and pocketed the cash. I mean, we've been ripped off, you know, <laughs> several different <laughs> different ways. And um, you know, I, I keep saying, hey, you know, I'm happy to pay that tuition because you know you're the project manager on this. Oh, my favorite was the guys. You know, these are guys. These are guys mostly from Mexico. They've never heard of a storm window in their life, and they went to Home Depot and they didn't order storm windows. They ordered custom uh, replacement windows. So then not only did I, have, I, have to, I had to pay triple the cost to install those custom replacement windows because you can't return them. You know, so, uh, you know, I've easily paid a worth of tuition, thousands of dollars for Mike's construction education. And what you're really banking on is that that person will become profitable for you uh, down the road once they've, because, you know, if they're the right kind of person, the embarrassment, the pain from failing will allow them to listen a lot more than if I hand them an SOP and be like, do everything in this book. And so that's what I was going to ask you. Know, you. That's you them responsible or feeling responsibility for those failures. Cause you don't, you don't just leave it open to look, we know we're going to fail. They feel it. Right. Yeah. I, I make sure that I have conversations where they feel like, let's not, let's not beat around the bush. Your lack of management. You know, I got you the job. I funded the job. I brought you the guys. You didn't manage it. You know, you failed. 
we both lose. I, you're not going to lose any money because I'm the one who's going to buy the hot water heater again. I'm the one who's going to pay the extra money to replace those windows. So, oh yeah, I will pay the tuition. You don't have to pay that out of your pocket. But, uh, you know, and you know, Mike feels, he hates it. It gives him anxiety. And I'm like, good, I'm glad you get anxiety because the next job, there's a, there should be, you should have a whole list of boxes that you need to check because it's so specific to Mike and his personal failures. And so why would I create an SOP from my standpoint when, when every person has their own little, what I need to be successful as a manager or what do I need to, to be successful as an employee kind of checklist that they have to go through. God, I, lo I really, really love that. Um, I was at my, so my son Isaac, who I, I think you met uh, at one of the summits, my son Isaac um, got sworn in to the military today um, into the Air Force. So he's going to the Air Force and the commander stepped up and there's only about eight kids that are getting sworn in. And I thought he did a great job of saying, you know, there's 325 million Americans and you're part of the 1%. So be proud. He said, but I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. He said, all of your success is going to lie completely outside your comfort zone, which is kind of a personal development 101, right? I feel like you run an, an operation, a company, well, many, many companies, many things that it's almost like the mission of getting people outside their comfort zone because, but living, giving them the scoreboard and abilities to do that because outside their comfort zone is where you've always felt they're going to grow right yeah yeah and 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 i think helping people see you know they say they say uh employees want three things they want autonomy they don't want to be micromanaged they want purpose they want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves but but then they want mastery and there's a really great ted talk about those three things autonomy mastery and purpose and the mastery thing is really key because people want to feel like they're getting a skill set they didn't have before. In Mike's case, it's how to manage construction jobs, right? Because he's not a construction person. So they're getting a skill set that they can export and take with them to another operation and monetize. And as a leader, it's about having the courage to say, yeah, I have no problem with you learning construction management because I'm hoping that you'll see the way that I do business and the way that I treat you will be such that you'll want to stay with my, without me making you sign a bunch of contracts, non-competes, what have you, that you'll want to be affiliated with us because staying with us you'll see as a path to get you a little bit further down the road than maybe if you go out on your own and and yeah. that's having the confidence in, in in your own ability to negotiate that you have a wealth mentality versus a po poverty mentality but also your confidence where you, you'll say i'm cool with you learning my systems or my processes because you'll be a better member of our team even see if you don't if you don't expose yourself to your partners if the, if each of you can't hurt the other person then you lose a valuable component of good partnerships, whether it's uh, you know business partners or employee employee bo uh, 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 boss relationships, where if each can't kind of hurt the other, then they don't care as much, and that that in and of itself becomes a binding force that keeps both parties at the table present and engaged and working. And so uh, it's it's hard to do that. It's hard to have that be like you know if he bails, I, 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 everything that I wasted teaching him construction will go with him. Uh, but if he stays, you know, if he stays, then this could be phenomenal for me because then now I'll have someone who can make me, you know, uh, $3 for every dollar that they earn and be a really profitable resource for me. Yeah, I've noticed you you do that really well with people where you give them the autonomy, you give them the ability, you don't hold their feet to the, but, but at the same token, you build so much brand loyalty and, and, and personal relationship loyalty that that's better than a contract a lot of times. So, um, it can be really big. And I, I, as much as I'd like to actually dig into some stories of how you got some of your key people, because I think you do some creative ways of finding the right people. I know we have a lot to cover. So I wanted to shift gears a minute to really something you talk about in your book, but you talk about a lot because you know that mindset is the key, the gateway to success in real estate, stock, asset, whatever. And, and you're successful in so many areas. You talk a lot about the difference between a five, six, seven figure mindset you know, uh, or eight figure mindset, right? Could you just kind of, uh, for the, the people listening, talk a little bit about what separates or what, what are the, the benchmarks that happen to get to that next level in their mindset, no matter where they're at? Yeah, so um, to go from a five to a six figure mindset, some of the critical components of that are um, realizing that if you wanna make big money, you have to take big risks. You know, you can't you can't invest ten thousand dollars and make twenty million bucks. And so, if you want to make a hundred thousand, if you want to make half a million dollars, find your way to put your hands on a hundred thousand dollars or one hundred fifty thousand dollars, because making five times on your money is is phenomenal. In fact, learning what a good return in is is re return is 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 five figure to six figure. So knowing 
that if I invest in a rental property, 10% is phenomenal. But if I invest in myself, I need to make 500%. You know, if it's my active income, if I'm doing flips or if I'm owning a business, I need to make a much different return than if it's a passive investment. So learning active and passive is big because, you know, when you have a five figure income, you're thinking, I need another job to make more money. So I'm teaching high school and then I'm coaching, you know, sports all three seasons. And I remember I did summer school and picked up some bartending shifts. Um, and and now, you know, with a company that does over a hundred million, the last thing I think about it, I don't want more businesses. You know, I had one of my contractors approach me recently and he said, hey, let's do, I, I found this product you can spray on roofs that, that extends the life five years to almost any roof. And, I, and, and he's like, let's buy up some franchises. And it gave me anxiety because I don't want, that's active income. I don't need, <laughs> I don't need more ideas on businesses. I already have, you know, over, over a hundred LLC business accounts. Um, and that so, might be a good, that might be a good opportunity to take just a second because I know you build a framework for the difference between five, six, seven, and eight figure mindset around active and passive. Just for those that maybe haven't heard you talk about this before, could you just kind of define the difference between the way you view active and passive? Because most people just feel I want to go from active, a job, to passive. Like my goal well, is to jump to that, right? So maybe you could define the two and then kind of build us through the mindset. So with the five figure mindset, mindset making a five figure income as a high school teacher, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and by Robert Kiyosaki, and I go, oh my gosh, I need, I didn't even think about passive. I need passive income. So what I, I went out and I bought a rental property, and and I meet people who have three, four, or five rental properties with really high leverage, like I did, and I remember thinking, man, it's like I don't even, uh, you know, own this rental property. And I was watching a Dave Ramsey podcast a few months ago where he actually statistically showed that unleveraged portfolios of properties over time do significantly better than highly leveraged portfolios, the no money down crowd that, you know, yeah. I was, I was seduced by. And, and so, um, I just lost my train of thought because I was thinking about that podcast. Active passive. Yeah. So, um, oh, now I remember. So, What's interesting is, and I actually diagrammed this for an investor uh, uh, on Saturday in, in, at our training in Indianapolis. I said, 90% of your brain power when you make a five or a six figure income, you need to be obsessed about learning how to make a million, two million, three million dollars uh, active income. Like, be, be, you know, I said, last week I made $250,000. This week I made $400,000. Think how many passive investments I can go buy if I make a lot of money and only live off of 20% of it. And, and, and I didn't realize that. I, I, I thought if you, you just had to focus on buying passive investments, buying rentals, investing your money. But, but it, you know, if, if every one of you listening had a hundred million dollars deposited into your bank account, number one, what would you do with it? But number two, uh, you would, you know, most of you would probably go out and invest in a lot of passive assets. So how do you get to a hundred million dollars? It's very difficult to buy one rental and let the rent come in and, and, and get to $100 million from one rental property. Passive can buy more passive, but active can buy way more passive much more quickly. And so, you know, I'll never forget the engineer who had a spreadsheet that showed me his $100,000 in his 401k and how he was going to leverage and then do this. And, then, and, and it was like he had spent hours mapping out what he was going to do with this hundred thousand and i said dude you're just putting you know padding on the seat in your rowboat you know <laughs> figure out how to get the money to buy a yacht i said your hundred thousand dollar 401k sucks it's too little you can't live off it when you retire uh you need a million dollars in the ira how do you how do you get to that you know what, what can you set up to, to increase your net worth and i didn't understand that i didn't understand where the brain power needed to go because you know, it was really easy last week for me to say, hey, we have, my wife and I only needed 10,000 of this. Great. Now, where can I put the other, you know, $290,000 into what projects do I have mapped out? And so that's a powerful concept that I didn't understand initially. And then a lot of five and six figure, they think that active is my job and I want to quit my job and live off my passive. Okay, great. I understand that Robert Kiyosaki laid that out in Rich Dad Poor Dad, but, uh, you know, it's, there's a price to that. So you, you, do you only want 3000 a month or 2500 a month? Or would it maybe be better to obsess about active for five years, 10 years, make $5 million, and now you got 30000 a month to live off of? 
you know, um, my passive now is 100 and 130,000 and it doesn't feel like enough because I made the mistake of, of flying on a chartered private jet. And <laughs> now I, I'm like, no matter how I crunch the numbers, whether I rent the plane or whether I buy the plane or whether I use a, a, a private uh, uh, charter flight service, I need a hundred thousand a month to, to get off of Delta airlines and flight commercials. So I'm like, how do I, you know, how do I create a hundred thousand passive that can earmark earmark towards charter flights, right? And so it's like, you know, what do you want? And then how do you up, make the active income so that so that it can fund that? That's it. That's well, I want to really emphasize that key because when I first met you, I uh, like most people, active just sounds like work. It just sounds like work, yeah. and passive sounds like not work. And we all want to move, like you mentioned, Kiyosaki, from one quadrant to the other quadrant. But what I noticed about you, in addition to successful people that think both, not either or, is you are actually actively trying to increase your active income every day in as much as increasing your passive. And while you do that is when you kind of move your floor of where you're going and you inch up your benchmarks. But you are constantly thinking, man, the more active I get, the more passive I'm going to have, not how do I move from one to the other? And so that that was a huge factor that I think a lot of people don't think about. They're just, how do I use, I get that question a lot. How do we use what we have right now to invest in that? And, and the yeah. question never comes up, how do I make more with what I got so that I can get more with that, right? If, if you're not ready to retire now, I mean, I, I, I was meeting with a client a few weeks ago and he's my age, like exact same age. We were uh, in, in men's choir together at BYU. and uh he's like yeah i just want to i just want to kind of live off my passive and travel the world and i'm like why you can like go on something what are you gonna go on tri three three weeks of trips a month i'm like you're too bright and way too young to to take off take your foot off the gas pedal of active because there's a buzz from active we've all had that moment whether it's at a job running a business or in a career where we're like man this is fun i like this it's hard but but you know it's a good balance to everything else i have going on in my life and, and who doesn't know someone or hasn't heard about someone who sold their business prematurely, sit around and golf for a while and go, I, I want to get back in the game. I don't ever want to be that guy. So uh, I find it's much easier to spend 95% of your brain power on the active because if you have the right team and you have the right relationships, you can pay someone to babysit your passive. You can pay someone to help you just reinvest the passive. Now, you know, when I'm 70, I'm sure I'll flip flop and I'll be 95% passive, 5% active. But I think I, people don't, they're not mapping that out. I'm only 40, I'm only gonna be 47 this year. And so I'm not even, I, you know, I don't want any more than 5% of my brain thinking about passive, even though 95% of my money every month goes into passive. That's the difference. Well, but you, you also mentioned, and I think this is a key point to point out to everybody listening, is that you think about these kind of things. Most people don't, they, they're reacting to all the work they have or the load they have, then they try to find the time. You literally, you, I mean, I've seen you draw it out, map it out, yeah. your plan. You think long term and then back it into the short term. And most people don't even consciously have an awareness of what is active, what is passive and how they're doing that. And so that, that's a, do, have you been doing that? kind of your whole career or do you find that you've been doing uh, it more and more now? Yeah, it's been as and I wish somebody would have broken it down for me that way because I had this epiphany about it and realized, you know, when I sold a deal and made $200,000 and realized that I could buy three rentals free and clear and then that's 1500 a month in my long term, that's my pension. I thought, man, that's that's different. I didn't realize it until I had the cash. And it's funny, my wife and I are building it. We want to build a house right now. And um, man, I'm struggling with taking active income money and putting it into my own house because we have a nice house. Uh, you know, we, we between Indianapolis and Charlotte and, and Idaho, we have over $2 million in unleveraged homes that are residences. And, and uh, we'd like to build another house. But, you know, every $100,000 that that we put into, you know, a, a mansion for us to me is like a thousand bucks a month. I'm losing in passive and it like gives me anxiety. And so when you reprogram your mindset to, to only live off of, you know, let me just be more specific. If you live, I don't care how much money you make. If you're living off of more than 80% of what you make active income right now, you don't know how to, like you're, you, you, you got to learn to live within your means. You need to cut your budget, right? And, and then on the flip side of that, if you make over half a million dollars a year, 
you should be living off of half of that. And over a million dollars a year, you should be living off of only 30% of that. Because, you know, at four or five million bucks a year, we live off of, you know, 5% uh, of what we make active income. And, 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 and that's huge because that allows you to really put a ton of, of, of money into passive projects and, and, and really make a long-term decision. I mean, I just completed the rehab on a 17-unit apartment complex in Indianapolis that I spent two years slowly rehabbing, two years of 30 to 40,000 a month that I was parking in that project. It's worth $6 million now. I bought it for 800,000. And so it's turned into just this gem that's going to pay me 25,000 a month forever. But it required two years of no cash flow and just a $20,000 a month hold. And, and, you know, ask yourself if you have that kind of patience um, and, and could, could, you know, it was like every Monday, my contractor emails me or calls me. He's like, all right, well, I spent 18,500 last week. <laughs> and, you know, that was like yeah. my worst email on Monday mornings. And, and that's a mindset issue. Cause if you don't have the, the ability to delay gratification and say, uh, you know, so many people have these heavily leveraged mansions that they bought for three, four, five million bucks because they qualify for the mortgage, not a reason to own that property. Your own home is not an asset, uh, and you should have learned that when you graduated from Five Figure Mindset. It just doesn't make sense. I, well, I've noticed about you that, and this is a very interesting thing I want to point out because a lot of people think, um, you know, you have to be frugal, right? You got to be frugal. You got to be this. You're talking about discipline, but you combine it with an abundance mindset. In other words, Aaron doesn't he? He doesn't drive an old pickup truck. He doesn't, you know, he has a good lifestyle. He's talking about discipline to spend and live within your means, but an abundant mindset that grows it so quickly that you still have a lifestyle. You still have fun. You travel, you eat out, you spend time with your family. I, yeah. I know you fly them, you know, you know, in, in, in style. And I know that, um, you know, your wife's going to have some, some influence over this house, so we won't go there, but, but, <laughs> well, I didn't say but I it's didn't discipline say plus abundance, house. right? <laughs> yeah. And, and well, I mean, I think it's for what, you know, what Protect Wealth does such a nice job teaching what you what you teach is uh, how to have your business pay for the things you want. So I just bought a new uh, 150. I didn't buy my business just leased for me a new $150,000 Range Rover in Indianapolis. And um, look, my business is going to owe taxes, so I can either give it to the IRS or I can I can uh, give it to Range Rover. Uh, so you know, or, or, you know, I took a business trip with my partner from Charlotte for Christmas. We didn't have the kids there with their parents. And we, you know, we rented a house on the beach in Mexico that was $14,000 for five days. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, you want to build in fun into your life and, and having nice things. It's not about austerity. It's not about poverty or miserliness, but it's about what can you really afford, right? Because if, if 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 twenty percent of your income is still uh, eight hundred thousand dollars a year and you don't have any debt, well, that's some nice vacations. That's some nice cars. Right. That's yeah. some nice some nice meals and first class tickets. Eight hundred thousand goes a long way without any mortgage on your house, without any car payments. So that's the thing. Is again, it all goes back to active income and how much money can I make and then invest the rest? Because I don't feel bad dropping. We just I just booked. A spring break with my stepkids for twenty five thousand dollars. I don't feel bad about that uh, because it's 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 built into my fun budget, and I have no problem spending one hundred fifty thousand or two hundred thousand a year on trips um, if that amounts to five percent of what I make. So it's you know yeah. that's that's the difference. Yeah, well, I love I love the concept of just the discipline because if it's discipline to spend within your means with the abundant mindset, then you know your your it's not about pinching pennies or thinking scarcity, right? And also, you mentioned taxes. We don't have time to get into it a lot here, but you know, I heard the other day, and and Kendall and I were talking about this is something that Protect Wealth teaches a lot is the simplest, quickest, easiest, safest way to increase what you have is save money on your taxes. And I know you have some pretty awesome, sometimes aggressive strategies with taxes, but the bottom line is 5% on your taxes, 10% on your taxes. Sometimes people are looking to save a penny rather than trying to get um, proactive and take care of their financial future in a disciplined way. Then through an abundant mentality, you're still living the life. You're still growing and, and building your active income. So you do an amazing job of that. You you actually, people don't think about it, but you, you have a whole like tax strategy behind everything you're doing as well as other investments. 
how, how big would you say taxes have been for, for you? So uh, in my case, based on a 40% 40, 40 tax bracket, so my passive investments bring in net of just over a million bucks a year, but my tax, my aggressive tax strategies, uh, the, this, the, the management companies, the LLCs, paying my children, really maximizing every loophole that, that lobbyists have created for business owners uh, saves me uh, almost $2 million a year that I don't have to give to the IRS. And, you know, I mean, wow. look at our president, uh, you know, regardless of what your politics, the man has played the tax game masterfully. Uh, or, you know, again, look at look at Michael Bloomberg. He hasn't released his tax returns because he doesn't want everyone to see either at $60 billion in net worth uh, how what his, what his personal tax game plan has been. And so if that's an area where you're deficient, uh, you know, imagine if you you didn't get the first class tickets, you didn't get the five star resort and you gave that money to the IRS last year. You gave them an extra 20 grand that could have been, uh, you know, upgraded vacation or upgraded Christmas or upgraded wardrobe or upgraded car and you gave it to the IRS. It should, it should keep you up at night. And so for me, it's double what I make for my passive investments in terms of what I don't have to give to the IRS. It's huge. Yeah, and the challenge for most people is not only did they give it to the IRS, but then they went out and also spent it on the trip and everything else. So they actually have both, whereas you could just with some strategies, literally have that pay for it. And for those of you that are wondering, like some of these amazing ultra high net worth uh, tax strategies, I mean, you're just gonna have to go to the Alpine cash flow event or go to the summit because there really are some great things you can do. And that, that's kind of not the purpose of our call, but I wanted to emphasize it because discipline means for what, what Aaron's saying is it means in everything you do, anything, anything and everything, whether it's spending money, spay, you know, paying taxes, whatever it is. And that discipline with abundance has kind of gotten you where you want. So let's shift gear. Well, actually, so just finish the thought on um, we've had a real foundation of active and passive, and you've talked about a five, six figure mindset. What about going to that seven figure, eight figure mindset? What are the big, you know, you know, flags and, and, and the big indicators that will take you to that level? So if you don't have a secret sauce, if you don't have a proprietary, um, app that you wrote or, um, some formula for, for, uh, curing Parkinson's disease, if you don't have a secret sauce that's patented, then you really need to differentiate on execution and and diversification. I think those two words are huge. And so, you know, we do property management. And uh, in, in every market that I'm in, there's hundreds of other companies that do what we do. And so the only way that we're able to differentiate is, is on executing uh, the product that we deliver. Um, but at the same time, you know, in real estate, there's always a way that in, in every market, there's some easy ways to make money and then there's some really tough ways. So like, you know, right now it's really tough to get flips. Everybody watches the flipping shows. Everybody's trying to get deals. And, and so because I have a diversified strategy or tool belt for real estate, I only have uh, two retail flips right now that I'm doing out of mm -hmm. um, 250 properties that I'm actively working on. And so, you know, I mean, when I got started 20 years ago, I was a one trick pony, flip houses, flip apartments. And, you know, I've learned to, 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 to do apartment complexes. I've learned mobile homes. I've done uh, hard money lending. I've done uh, new developments. And so I don't care what the market does. I don't care if the market crashes in November. There's going to be a, a different way to monetize um, my space outside of that. But then the other thing is, is having the businesses and developing the businesses so that you always, you're always thinking about what your backup plan is. So um, I always think, you know, if this were to happen, then I would do that. And this is how I would cover this. And so seven figure mindset individuals, not only do they have a really secure floor to build off of eight figure mindset, um, they also have game plans regardless of what happens in the market or in the, in the space that they're in. And, and um, that's how, for me, that's how I sleep at night because I don't care. Uh, if a Republican or a Democrat gets elected, I don't care if the stock market crashes. I don't care if the real estate market crashes. Been there, done that. I wrote out that I made more money after the, the time the market crashed in 2008 when, you know, it's the whole Warren Buffett says when, when people are fearful, be greedy. When people are greedy, be fearful. And the epitome of that is having diversification and then really having the execution so that as your competitors potentially fall by the wayside, 
um, you know, let me give you an example of that. So we just set up a, mo um, a modular home dealership in Idaho and we were over there checking out the office yesterday and I made the conservative decision to buy the land free and clear. I made the conservative decision to put our new office on there free and clear. And we were talking to one of our partners and I said, you know, this business could break even on one deal a month. And he said, well, what do you think you're going to do? I said, 10 to 15 deals a month. And he's like, that makes sense why so many other modular home dealerships have gone under over the last 20 years, because they finance the dirt, finance the office, put 20 homes on there for model home sales and, and had this, this nut they had to meet of 30,000 a month. And when they didn't for four months and they went under. And, and so, um, you know, that's, that's a six figure, five figure mindset approach. Seven figure mindset is, um, yeah, I hate dumping half a million dollars into that business. It'd be much more cool dumping it into my personal house or uh, you know a, a fractional ownership in a jet but this is a passive you know brick that i'm putting in the in the racetrack that 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 i want to that i want to race on and so it's it's never sexy to take the conservative approach and to build your passive it never is and, and i think that's why people struggle with it so much but but to a seven figure mindset and an eight figure mindset uh, passive forever is very sexy. You and I were talking before the show about a project, a deal that that we could have sold uh, after a year, half the ownership in the deal for 100% of what we paid. And we're mm -hmm. actually thinking about not doing it because the one thing I said to my partners is, what are we going to do with the money? Because I don't know of another deal that would be this good. Mm -hmm. And you know, 40000 a month passive is a lot more sexy to me than getting $2 million in, in next month. And they were all like, oh, yeah, I guess so. They hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. Well, you talk a lot about a floor, and and I think along this concept, I think it's important to note that so many entrepreneurs, investors, business owners, and individuals right now, they want to skip right from the five or the six to the seven or the eight. They want to skip. And the, the impression I've gotten from you is that there's no skipping. What you're doing is raising the floor. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do it quickly. There's people right. that move the floor quickly, but you create a floor that moves up as as you've moved to that and it gets bigger and bigger, but that's a foundation, right? That's why people that do skip up to that income, that active income or whatever, most always come back down because there's no floor underneath them. There's no foundation, but you talk a lot about a floor and that's, it's not necessarily conservative, right? Because you're, you're building a foundation that you're inching up as you go along and create net worth, right? Well, you and I have a friend that we were talking about recently in California who's, who started his business five years ago, hired a bunch of sales guys. And, and um, I know you and I both know for a fact he's got $25 million in the bank that he's made. Um, but, you know, there was some government legislation came down the pipeline. FCC gives him a call and now he's shutting down his operation. And and I've never, you know, I it makes me want to throw up to have to go to employees like, hey, George, you know. I know that you bought in. I know you've done really well for three years, but I got to lay you off because, man, I just miscalculated and I don't have I don't have another game uh, plan for you or for the business. But, you know, I got twenty five million dollars. Like to me, that that's that's a loss. That's a failure. Yeah. And, and and I'll be the first to admit it's why I'm not worth two hundred million dollars right now. But my 50 million is really, really solid. 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 Yeah. No, that's huge. But and so that actually leads me to one more question I was gonna ask you, because you talk about the difference being execution and diversification. This has come up a lot. What do you personally feel is the value of diversification versus focus? In other words, you know, someone's doing real estate, they're focused in on something they're really good at, but diversification is what kind of helps them when the markets shift. When how do you balance diversification with focus? Oh, that's a great, great question because you have to be, you know, like for the last two years, I've been deep diving in the mobile home, manufactured home, trailer park, modular home universe yeah. and speaking, thinking, breathing it. And so I've been a hundred, you know, 90% of my brain power has been focused on how do I monetize it? How do I set it up? How do I secure it? How do I prepare my investments in that for any type of change in the market? And so it's required an enormous amount of time to get expertise. You know, it's just like I remember uh, I couldn't shoot a three point shot to save my life in high school. And I spent one whole summer out in front of my house shooting 200 shots a day. Right. And, and, and that was all I did after work for that whole summer. And in, in, in the timeline of my life, that wasn't a big deal. But uh, dabblers are not the same as diversifiers. 
You know, dabblers oh, are like, oh, okay. shiny object guys, you're saying. So it's not yeah, like constantly like, picking oh, things up. Oh, I did flips. I don't really like that. Oh, I learned how to do one. I, I learned how to trade an iron condor option, but that was, you know, that I lost money on that. I meet dabblers all the time. They're better off at their job because, um, you know, uh, diversifiers really gain expertise on something. For, you know, for example, I'll probably never build new construction homes again. I've bought land, I've developed it, I've built, you know, custom homes. And I just don't, I don't think it's a good way to make money, but it's not because I didn't build 20 homes. Uh, you know, it's not because I, I just built one spec home and said, oh, no, I don't think I like that. You know, I spent the time to gain the expertise that I know I could make a living as a builder. It's mm. just not something compared to other things that I've gained expertise in, like mobile home parks, like single family homes, like apartment complexes, things I'll always do. Or another one's Airbnb. I love Airbnb up to about five, but I don't like it for more than five. But I figured that out when I had 35. So I had, uh, I didn't yeah. dabble in Airbnbs. I, lo I love how you put that because that kind of clicked for me. The bottom line is diversification is not dabbling. What you're saying is when you do a diversification, it's not about when do you diversify, when don't you? It's when you make a commitment to do a deep dive into the diversification. It's not when you decide to dabble in it and see yeah, if it works so, and then you add it to your repertoire, right? And so either you need to have the expertise, you need to have a partner who has the expertise enough to where you could say, this is why I don't, like I could tell you, you know, over a couple of hours why I don't think Airbnb is scalable, why I don't love it as a scalable investment, just like why I don't like building new construction homes, but it's not because I don't have, and my partners and I don't have the expertise. And and if I don't have the, maybe I don't know how to manage an Airbnb from the website that great, but I have business partners that manage them for me on mm -hmm. deals that we own. And I absolutely can quarterback that decision enough to say, no, I don't want to earmark more of my capital to that. But then there's spaces like apartment complexes. I, I, I bought my first one year one and I'm, I just bought another in year 20. I'll always be in that space. Just like single family homes, I'll always be in that space. And so um, learning enough to make an intelligent decision is much different. That's diversifying. That's not dabbling. So the, that's a real. Those are really good. Those are really good pointers for people on the call. You know, if you have a partner, an individual that has the deep knowledge in it, or you make a commitment to deep dive, that's not dabbling. And most people that diversify dabble. They don't focus. And so, so uh, what you're kind of saying is that you can diversify in a focused way by deep diving. And that's that. It's not about when do you focus, when do you dabble. It's it's just a commitment, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's something it. I'm always, you know, every time I found something new, I mean, I bought my first mobile home park in 2003 and then I bought six more last year. So um, it's a space that I think I'll always be in. Um, but, you know, there's some things uh, every time you can add a new uh, knowledge base like that to, to what you're doing. It's just like, you know, now that I spent the time to learn how to ride a bike and get the padded shorts now, it's one more cardio that I can do every day to, to yeah. you know, to beat the boredom of cardio. It's the same thing with business. Well, it goes back to what you originally said, which is that extra deep dive and some diversification and execution is what takes you to the bigger mindset. But you have to be patient or the bigger, you know, you're going to an eight figure mindset, nine figure mindset, but you have to be patient and disciplined to deep dive with it. So. Mm -hmm. Man, this the oh my gosh, man! I could like pick your brain all day long, man. I got so many notes, but here's here's what I want to do because the, these guys are gonna kill me if we don't hit this a little bit before we go. Um, with real estate, could you comment just a bit about where you see some of the opportunities right now? Because you've mentioned everything from apartments yeah. and commercial and single family to Airbnb, and maybe as you're doing that, talk to us about which of these fit into the active versus the passive. And just where do you see some things going? Um, because you seem to have a, a trend of success in whatever you do because you've done a lot of due diligence. You're not just guessing. So talk to us a little bit about the trends right now. So uh, for those of you that are more research minded, I love Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Study uh, website. It's one. It's probably the best macroeconomic think tank platforms that's out there. And uh, if it, it just you don't have to log in. There's no subscription. You can just go click on their research and start reading through. And they just published their 2020 state of, of housing. And, and, the, and the, the trend that just is so massive right now is we have an affordability crisis with housing. And, and so even though the market has been strong for 11 years, even though interest rates are at, a, at you know, at 3%, um, we're underbuilt in this country. The, the, the builders are, are probably about 4 million homes underbuilt. 
And because home prices have appreciated since the last time the market crashed in 2008, uh, and wages have not increased, increased, we have this disparity um, of affordability that is forcing Americans back to being renters. Now, I've seen some cities like Minneapolis, like Seattle, where they've eliminated uh, single family home zoning. So imagine in Minneapolis, you're a homeowner in a single family home neighborhood, and all of a sudden, they just remove that classification. So you can now build a duplex in your backyard. Mm. That's one of the reasons why we're in the modular home space, because uh, with my, we just got our third dealership in place in Charlotte a couple weeks ago. Um, I could go to you and say, hey, wow. uh, you want to buy this two bedroom modular home prefabricated? We'll put a concrete slab in your backyard. We'll put the home and now you're getting $1,500 a month rent. That's good for cities because now it's more rentals. That's good for homeowners who overpaid on their home because now that's $1,500 a month coming in or they can put their mother-in-law in there. And so one of the reasons why I think modular and manufactured homes are such a big space is because city councils all over the country are going, whoa, we don't have enough homes built for the amount of people that are living here and moving mm -hmm. here. There, we, we can't get induced builders to do it. What are we going to do? And so I've seen, um, you know, for years it was difficult to get financing on a, on a mobile home in a park even a brand new one. And I've actually seen Fannie Mae discussing underwriting those mortgages. Could you imagine if that if that comes out, what that's gonna do to that that space in terms of opportunity? So that's huge. And, and those of you that have the opportunity to, to, to pick up rental property in blue collar entry level home neighborhoods, and those are the kind of properties that we sell to investors, um, that's the most underbuilt segment of the housing market that's out there. Uh, builders that are in the space are building upper income, higher end custom homes because they make all their money on the upgrades. And so one of the reasons that we sell rental property to investors turnkey that's fixed up and rented out is because that allows you as an investor to capitalize on the fact that we're becoming a nation of renters. But, but when people do want to convert from renters to homeowners, you have a home in the market segment that they're able to uh, to buy in. So I just saw at our Dallas, our Alpine Property Management in Dallas, my partner Kendra just listed a property on the market that we sold to a client for $110,000 eight years ago. She just listed it for 270. And in that neighborhood, that's an entry level home. And wow. so our client rented that property out for years and made you know eight, nine, 10% a year on the rents. And now they're looking at picking up 100,000 after commissions, $150,000 from selling it to a homeowner. And that's kind of the vision that we have for our investors from a passive standpoint. But if you're active and you're in this space, you know, mobile home is phenomenal. You know, I, last summer we did a couple of uh, one day seminars with Protect Wealth uh, on mobile home and on Airbnb. Uh, it, don't think flips, think Airbnb right now. Don't think um, commercial because commercial is just, you know, apartments are so, it's so competitive to get apartments right now. Think uh, mobile home, think manufactured home. Those are the real kind of active income opportunities. And, and in terms of passive income, notes are good. Um, buying and investing in notes, buying entry level blue collar rentals are, are really strong right now. Uh, you just gotta be in the right market. You can't make any money on a rental property in California, but you absolutely can in one from Kansas City or, or Indianapolis or, or Charlotte, so. That's huge. Um, I, I have noticed, and for those of you listening in, I wanna make a note and just give you a couple of resources because um, what Alpine Capital Solutions has done on their Facebook page has been amazing. They have a lot of like market statistics and articles and key things. So if, if you want a resource to be able to get really good up-to-date things uh, and, and kind of stay tied in with Aaron and the group, go to at Alpine Capital Solutions, which is their Facebook page. Um, and, and for those of you that may or may not qualify to be able to go to uh, maybe s some more private exclusive events with with um, Aaron, you can go to um, the PassivelyInvest.com website as well. That's one that Protect Wealth has put together with Aaron that kind of gives a little bit more detail about what he does. I know that's not something you were gonna be mentioning here, Aaron, but I, 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 I didn't wanna fail to mention that people may want to connect with you more on those areas. Obviously, the Tips, Tricks, and Flips of Real Estate uh, Millionaire, that, that book is a gold mine of stuff that we just did. So if you haven't already picked that up on Amazon, you wanna do that. And I think we're gonna be providing that for our mastermind members specifically, but those are three really good ways for people to kind of stay connected with you because you're really knowledgeable. I mean, you take the school teacher in you, the expert in you, the, the, the diversified guy in you, you're good at teaching these concepts. 
what what other ways are those the best ways for people to kind of stay connected with you? Yeah, I'm I'm I've been I I, I just uploaded three articles today. I, I spent about at least an hour and sometimes up to two hours doing research. Uh, all those hours I spent on a stairmaster, a treadmill, I'm reading this reading through articles. <laughs> Your <laughs> ADD like novel. me is kicking in, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, if you're on Facebook, Alpine Capital Solutions has a page. The only thing I put there is primary resource. Uh, our AlpineCapitalSolutions.com. Uh, we just upgraded that website. Um, and then obviously, uh, I've been partnering with Protect Wealth for a long time. They have uh, a, a web page, and we'd love to to have you come to one of our events. We don't charge for our trainings, um, and and, and uh, we'd love to host investors that qualify. And the way you qualify is you just have some money that you can invest passively. And if you that you know you don't have to. You don't, you don't have to uh, uh, sign any commitments that you'll buy anything, but we sell deals. We, have, we make money selling deals. And so um, if, in fact, we had a slide that I threw up um, a couple weeks ago. It showed all the different uh, products that we have capital solutions for for our clients. And so uh, we'd love, we're always interested in looking for people who have an appetite for passive investments. And um, we've been working with you and with Protect Wealth for a long time. Uh, very, you know, I think we had probably half of our investors at our last event were Protect Wealth clients. Yeah, you know what I what I love about um, for those of you listening on the call and afterwards on the recording, one of the things I love about Aaron is um, when it comes to and the reason we wanted to feature him on this call is when it comes to finding someone super successful to pattern your life after to to get the the mindset, the strategies, the execution, the support, the resources. He hits it. I mean, we've been able to talk today about not just, you know, the differences in mindset and some of the strategies and active and passive and real estate, um, you know, trends. I really feel like you've got to surround yourself with successful people and you can learn, you know, and if you're hesitating or you don't have the confidence or you don't you don't maybe have the belief because you, you don't have the experience yet. So you can't have the belief when you surround yourself with people like Aaron, you you get this belief transference, right? He makes it seem like it's so easy and so simple or so confident. He's got the confidence. You get that kind of come across. And the fact that you give away education like you do um, yeah. because you actually want to help people do it. I know it upsets a lot of people that are in the space of selling education and books and tapes, but it's one of the things I love the most about you because you do it freely and you do it uh, in a really deep dive way, but it's also relevant to the market. So really appreciate you doing this. We're super glad that we had you here today. So thank you, man. I really appreciate it.